So good afternoon and welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of the ELISA team and of course uh, of the ELISA knowledge transfer team. Today, um, uh, Lorena Hernandez, uh, who is a project officer and myself, Simon Vrecher, a consultant. Uh, so we are both at the European Commission's Joint Research Center uh, and we will be hosting the second of the um, three webinars of the knowledge transfer pack describing the ELISA, ELISA achieving different ob objectives. Um, just to remind you, as it was announced already in the, in, in the, in the join up page, this, this uh, webinar pack is actually uh, complementary to the event that was uh, held uh, two weeks ago uh, during the ELISA um, um, digital public, uh, public event. So today we have the webinar with the title Interoperable Frameworks and Solutions for Cross-Border and Cross-Sector uh, um, Services. Uh, maybe at the beginning, a few words about the, the ELISA, uh, so the European Location Interoperability Solutions for e-Government, uh, which is an acronym for ELISA, and it's uh, an action that is a part of the ISA Square program. Uh, which is a, a European interoperability program aiming um, at providing cross-border and cross-sector interoper interoperability solutions for public administrations, businesses and citizens. More than 50 different actions uh, tackle interoperability from different angles under the umbrella of ISA Square, while ELISA is the only one amongst them uh, uh, focusing on the uh, location dimension. Uh, since the adoption of the ISA Square program in 2016, ELISA has supported building a location-enabled digital government. Uh, for this, we understand the public administration that actively uses the value and benefits of the spatial dimension and in, in its processes. So the entire concept uh, is actually built on three essential elements, which are digital transformation, location, and interoperability. Uh, with all its inputs, good practices and legacy, um, ELISA will also provide firm inputs to future activities within the uh, just started uh, digital program uh, related to improving and enhancing the European interoperability by using location data and intelligence. Uh, so what is ELISA about? ELISA actually has, uh, it breaks down the barriers and promote a, a coherent and consistent approach to the sharing and reuse of location data across sectors and across borders, which would be also the, 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 the main uh, topic of today's uh, webinar. And this all in the context of the digital transformation of public services. That is done by supporting different policy initiatives on European and national level, by providing interoperable cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administration, businesses and citizens, discovering how emerging trends and technologies enable more effective use of location data for policy and digital public services. And last but not least, building geo, uh, geo knowledge base uh, to inform and train stakeholders and promote the adoption of uh, good practices and innovation in location data. So all these uh, achievements are being done by different by different types of outputs. There are actually four types of outputs. Uh, so are uh, the are carrying studies uh, to assess enablers and barriers of location interoperability. Um, developing frameworks of guidelines and recommendations and reusable tools. Uh, developing pilots and applications to test principles in practice and uh, uh, providing new knowledge transfer and capacity building and stakeholder support uh, to help improve and implement location interoperability. Uh, as you can see on the right side of the slide, uh, so these, uh, these uh, four types of outputs are actually covering different, different uh, fields and topics, which we won't go into the details uh, right now. Um, but uh, let uh, maybe uh, list some of the achievements that um, Elise has reached uh, during five years of the of the of the of the of the, of the action. So uh, Elise complemented the European interoperability framework uh, and NIFO, which uh, with an extensive location interoperability framework and stand, state of play assessment, and provided to leave uh, to EIF uh, three solutions to the so-called EIF toolbox. Uh, as well, Elise helped put the Inspire directive 
into practice uh, with tools for data providers and strong focus on use cases. It has built also extensive community of European and international stakeholders together with an active engagement of the ISA Square uh, member states, raised awareness of new approaches uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and also other things. Uh, so maybe before continue uh, to mention uh, the importance of the of the knowledge transfer actually uh, uh, activity uh, to uh, in the uh, overall ELISA action. So it was it plays uh, quite an active role uh, to achieve all the ELISA objectives. And uh, we all know that knowledge transfer is uh, usually quite a complex process of disseminating knowledge from one individual team or organization to another uh, to foster innovation, incre increase efficiency, solve problems, and so on. On the ELISA action, uh, we tried to do it uh, through different principles. So establishing a mut mutual beneficial collaborative community with its, stake with its stakeholders creating an interactive environment, enabling co-creation and open innovation, and to uh, turning uh, outputs into uh, actionable knowledge. So with all these, uh, we provided a lot of different activities, including the webinars. And like the webinar like uh, today, it's also uh, one of the example of the uh, activities uh, under the ELISA knowledge transfer. So who we have here today with us, um, so there is uh, Massimo Pedroli, senior consultant in public sector from Deloitte, uh, who will uh, share with us, uh, let's say, some in insights on the uh, uh, in interoperable frameworks and solution, uh, cross-border and cross-sector. So please, uh, Massimo, what uh, will be the topics of the today's webinar? Thank you very much, Simon, uh, for your introduction um, and uh, as uh, um, Simon was mentioning, today we will go through a um, series of topics related to the uh, domain of uh, cross-border and cross-sector solutions. After a uh, first introduction uh, on location data and location interoperability uh, for cross-border services, so uh, delving in some basic concepts, we will have a short overview on the state of play uh, on sharing and using location data uh, across European borders. And uh, after that, uh, as we have done uh, throughout all of these uh, um, webinars under the knowledge transfer pack, uh, we will try to translate uh, these concepts into uh, concrete uh, user journeys. Uh, seen from the perspective of uh, uh, profiles of stakeholders uh, on how to exploit interoperable uh, cross-border solutions. Uh, the following section will deal with the uh, outcomes of ELISE uh, presenting the main outputs uh, dealing with the domain of interoperable solutions uh, uh, in a cross-border and cross-sector perspective. Uh, finally, uh, we will uh, summarize the key messages and challenges and future outlook uh, uh, presented by Elise. Uh, we will also have a final space for any questions that um, you may uh, want to specifically discuss on this topic. Um, so let's start with, as we said, uh, some basic concepts on location data and location interoperability for cross-border services. Uh, for each section, we have a first um, introduction for you uh, through um, uh, some questions uh, for you to get acquainted with the topic. Simon? Yes, indeed. So as you can see, we are starting with the short quiz for you. Uh, so uh, one of the main, uh, uh, let's say, topic in general on the ISA Square is the uh, European Interoperability Framework, so-called EIF. And uh, it has uh, different interoperability levels. And we are just asking you, maybe if you know which of those are the EIF interoperability level, are semantic, technical, economic, and organizational, legal, organizational, semantic, and technical, organizational, economic, legal, and environmental. So what do you think? It's a, just a simple quiz question. So just to maybe uh, 
reveal how familiar are you with the concept that will be also discussed during the webinar today. So maybe let's leave another five seconds. Thank you very much. So let's share the results. I think we can be quite proud of the audience, Massimo. What do you think? Yes, uh, that's uh, very reassuring. Uh, the IF is uh, pretty well known, apparently, throughout our, our audience. Uh, there's a consistent understanding of uh, the four levels of uh, interoperability in uh, the EIF uh, being uh, uh, the four ones that have been chosen by everyone here in the uh, poll. So um, we are talking uh, in general about uh, uh, interoperability, uh, but uh, what uh, is the reason uh, for focusing on location and on the location dimension in general? Uh, well, uh, location data or geospatial data, uh, as you can see here on this slide, uh, comprise anything uh, from addresses, uh, uh, data on buildings, uh, on road networks, etc., um, including dynamic data, not only static data. Um, and actually, this means that, uh, uh, as uh, reported here, uh, we can say that location is all around us. Uh, special is everywhere or from another perspective, uh, there's a location dimension under most of the data that are exchanged uh, in data spaces, uh, specifically also in cross-border and transnational contexts. Um, location data overall uh, facilitate data, facilitates data integration, uh, allowing to um, uh, see uh, similar data from uh, uh, different uh, uh, national contexts in a similar perspective. Uh, allows uh, taking data-driven decisions uh, based on where and why things happen. Uh, this is something that we have uh, recently experienced and we are still experiencing uh, with decisions, for example, related to health issues such as the pandemic we are uh, currently facing or uh, such as decisions on allocation of funds uh, in the context of uh, the uh, recovery um, plans uh, that are being developed by member states uh, under the umbrella of the European uh, Union. Um, it uh, also eases communications uh, through intuitive map representation, uh, representations that uh, visually translate uh, very clearly where things happen. And uh, the visual aspect is something that occurs often in location-based uh, solutions uh, and facilitates the understanding of data. Uh, and finally, it also enables visualization of sophisticated models and simulations. Um, so all of these uh, factors uh, represent a significant richness of uh, the location dimension in uh, um, data spaces. Um, let's now uh, talk about uh, location interoperability in connection with location data. Um, the notion of location interoperability, which is a particular instance of interoperability, uh, is grounded in the notion of location data. Uh, in fact, uh, the definition proposed by Elise uh, of location interoperability which can be found in the glossary uh, established by the ELISE collection on uh, the collaborative uh, platform of the European Commission join up is, as you can read here, uh, uh, that location interoperability is the ability of organizations, systems and devices to exchange and make use of location data with a coherent and consistent approach. So here, uh, Clearly, location interoperability is connected to location data. Location data uh, has also a known uh, definition, which is uh, uh, connected to the legal definition within the Inspire Directive, 
its data with a direct or indirect reference to a specific location or a geographical area. There are different uh, terms that are interchangeable with location data, uh, geospatial data or geodata are uh, examples of these interchangeable um, uh, terms. Um, such data are among the most borderless data sets in a data ecosystem and therefore foster and even require the development and use of interoperable cross-border and actually cross-sector solutions. Such solutions uh, exploiting cross-border data sets can offer public administrations, businesses and citizens seamless cross-border services, thus facilitating the creation of a digital single market. Uh, this leads us uh, uh, to um, considering this dimension uh, of interoperability within the uh, European digital single market. Uh, actually, breaking down the barriers to cross-border activity is a key objective of a digital single market in general. Um, in fact, uh, a digital single market is one in which the free movement of persons, services and capital is ensured and where the individuals and businesses can seamlessly access and engage in online activities. Um, the 2014-2019 uh, um, commission already, so the one uh, before the current one, I had identified the completion of the digital single market as one of its 10 political priorities. Uh, this objective uh, of breaking down barriers to cross-border online activity uh, has been at the core of the European digital single market strategy, uh, articulated in uh, and built on three pillars. Uh, access, uh, so uh, better access for consumers and businesses to digital goods and services across Europe, environment, uh, creating the right conditions and a level playing field for digital networks and innovative services to flourish, and uh, economy and society, uh, maximizing the growth potential of the digital economy. So in conclusion, location data is a uh, key enabler for the achievement of the digital single market pillars as it facilitates data integration, as we have seen in the previous slides. Uh, now, what about ELISE in this context? Um, data integration uh, calls for the removal of barriers to the reuse of data in different domains and geographies, as we have seen. Overcoming such uh, interoperability barriers requires investments in common and reusable interoperable solutions, which are most effective when included in a consistent framework, leveraging component approaches, data, and components. Elise um, comes in, uh, into play uh, here because it is, in fact, engaged in developing a framework of guidelines, recommendations, and reusable tools for implementing and enabling geospatial interoperability. Um, a consistent guidance for the design of such a framework is offered, uh, for example, by the European Location Interoperability Framework, uh, Blueprint, um, ULF Blueprint in short. Uh, the ULF Blueprint offers a location interoperability framework, as we said, under a European perspective, taking into account the particular European multinational uh, regulatory and economic context and state of play, uh, providing recommendations and guidance uh, under this perspective uh, for the exchange and use of uh, location data uh, in uh, government policies and digital public services. So this is where ELISE uh, comes in play. Uh, then let's uh, now talk about the state of play uh, as we were starting to uh, uh, comment on sharing and using location data across European borders. Again, a quick quiz for you, Simon. Yes, of course. So here we were referring to the LIFO 2019 indicators where 
uh, it was measuring delivering cross-border digital public services across government using the country's spatial infra data infrastructure. So the question here is, so uh, what do you think, what was the average value of this indicator measured in the 10 member states, which uh, zero is the, the poorest value and the one is the, 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 the richest value? So please, it's only a quiz. It uh, gives a uh, perception of uh, what you think uh, it happens currently uh, in the European uh, context. How in any case, perceive? Massimo will explain it quite soon. Yeah. But okay, let's let's finish the poll and share the results. Okay, quite. Uh, quite accurate results, let's say, perception mm -hmm. of the audience. Massimo, please continue. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Simon. Actually, uh, as it often happens, uh, the medium value <laughs> is often the one to choose. Um, and I see that it was chosen by most uh, participants to the poll. Um, yeah, let's uh, now delve further on uh, this dimension. Um, so, uh, we were mentioning before the ULF blueprint. Um, the ULF blueprint as a guidance document uh, uh, articulated in different uh, location, in different uh, focus areas, uh, considering uh, location interoperability, uh, considers uh, particularly under the uh, digital government integration focus area, uh, a cross-border aspect. Um, the ULF blueprint in particular identifies a current state of play where uh, digital innovation and collaborative developments are progressing in different policy areas, but much more can be achieved to benefit uh, users and partners. Um, this will require more user-driven SDI support for digital public services, data ecosystems, and digital platforms across the policy landscape and capable of meeting both national and European demands for location data. So which is the vision offered by the ULF blueprint uh, starting from the current state? Uh, well, uh, location uh, information uh, as a target uh, should be well integrated in digital public services and processes, uh, supporting new business models, more effective collaboration and location-based decision-making, and helping to transform public services delivered across government uh, and interacting uh, uh, with other governments, businesses, and citizens alike. Uh, um, spatial data infrastructures, SDIs in short, are fulfilling an important role in digital transformation, both nationally, nationally and in Europe. Um, the, uh, following the once only principle, uh, users do not only have uh, to supply the same information multiple times. Uh, the vision also uh, requires uh, that there is visibility of common coordinating and support structures, expert groups and technologies, a strong user voice in the design evaluation of improvement uh, and improvement of location-based services. So this is a quite challenging um, vision, as you can understand. Uh, LIFO, so the uh, Location Interoperability Framework Observatory, as um, uh, Simon was mentioning before, uh, launched uh, in 2019 and still uh, operating and going on. The uh, 2020 results are expected soon, are still being um, elaborated, has monitored the degree of adoption uh, of the ULF recommendations among which uh, the recommendation seven under this focus area um, relates specifically to uh, a cross-border perspective and cross-sector perspective. This recommendation states uh, 
that uh, it's uh, recommended to use spatial data infrastructures in digital public services and data ecosystems across sectors, levels of government and borders, integrated with broader public data infrastructure and external data sources. As you can see on the right, two indicators in the uh, LIFO in particular consider the delivery across border digital public services, um, showing that First of all, national SDIs were existing and effective, constitute the core infrastructure for the delivery of cross-border digital public services. And secondly, the second indicator, INSPIRE is frequently used as a lingua franca uh, for the delivery of cross-border digital public services. Um, Passing uh, to uh, the uh, dimension of uh, interoperable or reusable tools, uh, uh, Elise in particular has started contributing uh, to an integrated solutions framework as uh, seen from the fact that two flagship solutions of it, uh, the registry and the reference validator as shown here, enter the AF toolbox, uh, which is an example of an integrated solution framework for interoperability developed under the European interoperability framework. Uh, the ULF blueprint, on which we talked uh, just before, is also part of the such toolbox. Um, as you can see here, uh, the registry and the reference validator, uh, on which we will talk a bit more later on, uh, have found uh, several reusers uh, uh, Europe-wide. Uh, the registry, for example, has been uh, uh, has found complete application in Slovakia, uh, the Republic of North Macedonia, and by the European Commission itself, uh, while the reference validator um, has uh, found uh, use cases uh, in the Netherlands, in Germany and Denmark. Uh, just consider that these are only a few examples. Uh, as uh, Simon was mentioning before, uh, in the recent workshop held in the context of the digital uh, um, event, uh, it was highlighted as these two solutions can be actually considered flagship solutions and find um, quite a wide uh, reuse through um, member states. Uh, not only Elise has developed uh, its own uh, um, interoperable cross-border and cross-sector solutions, but has also uh, studied solutions developed under other initiatives. And what you can see here is a short list of such solutions. Uh, the first one, for example, I uh, won't uh, delve uh, into detail uh, of each uh, solution, but uh, in short, you can see uh, the uh, um, uh, Grand, Grand Région initiative under which uh, a geoportal uh, has been developed, uh, which enables uh, the users uh, to view the majority of the maps created by GIS GR in the form of cross-border layers in an interactive map. Here, uh, the aspect of cross-border, so uh, uh, initiatives uh, covering neighboring countries is uh, crucial uh, as uh, there's an intense cross-border, properly cross-border uh, activity in that specific region of the borders uh, between France, Belgium, Germany and Luxembourg. Uh, same goes with the Centrope map, um, another geoportal uh, connecting the Centrope region uh, covering uh, the um, uh, regions at the borders between Austria, Czechia, Hungary and the Slovak Republic. Uh, this is another geoportal collecting uh, web map services from partner countries. Uh, the locator um, uh, is another cross-border system, uh, mostly covering the private sector. So here we have solutions uh, engaging uh, and covering uh, um, a public uh, sector and uh, public, uh, private sector alike, as it is the case with the locator. Uh, this solution has been uh, developed uh, uh, with contributions and assist financial assistance of public bodies from Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, 
providing information on businesses on business locations. And there are several other solutions here. Uh, Crossroad uh, uh, is also a um, uh, solution covering um, activities uh, and data of uh, neighboring countries, in this case, uh, uh, Estonia and Finland. So uh, Elise has uh, studied and uh, um, considered the, the, uh, all of these solutions uh, and uh, extracted the recommendations and good practices uh, from all of those solutions that you can find in uh, several studies and elaborations uh, uh, under the ELISE action. Um, there are actually uh, not only benefits, but also some challenges in the use of location data in cross-border context. ELISE has uh, made a systematic analysis of those benefits and challenges in a study, which is uh, um, being published soon. Uh, that, that show that on the benefit side, uh, there are new and improved services made possible by accessing and using data from across borders uh, that uh, improved access to information has been both a pivotal motivator and benefit uh, resulting from cross-border data sharing initiative, uh, initiatives. Sorry. And this is true specifically in cross-border regions, as we said, where information sharing can be essential for planning, navigation, or attracting business. Um, then in the uh, European context specifically, cross-border projects and initiatives improve collaboration between partners and stakeholders. Uh, this happens uh, for the public sector as well as uh, for the private sector alike, as we said. Uh, finally, there are important economic benefits to sharing and using geospatial data across borders due to an improved ability uh, to innovate and bring new products and services to the public. Uh, however, uh, on the flip side, uh, there are challenges uh, under the um, economic aspect, for example, uh, where the lack of sustainable funding, which can endanger uh, the long-term uh, viability of project is uh, significant, has a significant uh, impact as a challenge. High costs related to both of, um, uh, data and infrastructure can prevent uh, the initial development as well as scaling up data sharing endeavors. Uh, there are also technical challenges, obviously, uh, related to the findability and accessibility of data, especially due to its fragmentation. This is true uh, at the national level, as all of you know, uh, experiencing it uh, in your respective countries. But uh, it's even uh, more true in a multinational and cross-border context, uh, where also uh, lack of uh, harmonization and interoperability, uh, as well as of widely recognized and applied standards, uh, have a significant impact uh, as a challenge. Uh, organizational impacts as well, uh, and challenges um, occur, such as the need to manage a functioning ecosystem and partnership uh, consisting of participants who may apply different standards, formats, uh, languages, and uh, other factors. Um, this also uh, is due to lack of awareness and need for further capacity building in terms of geospatial and location interoperability. Um, there are also challenges. There are also challenges under the legal and political aspect. Uh, so we are all tackling with all the dimensions of uh, interoperability that we've seen before. Uh, they find under uh, the AF uh, uh, model. Uh, licensing is one of those. Uh, uh, licensing uh, maybe uh, licensing issues may be costly, time-consuming, and cumbersome to deal with, uh, as you know, which discourages the stakeholders from pursuing cross-border projects and, and initiatives. Um, so this uh, is a short overview. You will find uh, more details on uh, those benefits and challenges in the upcoming study. 
but then, uh, as we said at the beginning, let's uh, now pass to a concrete perspective from the uh, view of some typical users. Um, Simon? Yes, before we go to the users, so let's uh, ask you another quiz question. So who are, in your opinion, the stakeholders that can benefit from interoperable cross-border and cross-sector solutions? Are there is a public administration and businesses, public administrations and citizens, or public administration, citizens and businesses? So who do you think will benefit? Maybe let's take another five seconds and then we'll close the quiz and the poll. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. So the most of you, 92% public administration, citizens and businesses. Yes, indeed, all will all will benefit from that. Please, Massimo. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, this is why we will have uh, a series of user journeys uh, uh, focusing on different stakeholders from all the um, clusters uh, that uh, we mentioned before. So uh, from the national and local level, the private and public sector, including uh, uh, representatives of uh, public administrations, uh, businesses and citizens, as we were saying. Uh, we have identified uh, um, two representatives of uh, the public administration side, uh, Elizabeth, a data ana analyst uh, working for a public administration and robot, uh, an ICT manager working for another public administration. Uh, we will uh, also um, uh, consider uh, the challenges faced by Anne, uh, a citizen, in dealing with uh, cross-border, uh, with a cross-border context, and as well by Josh, a digital public services provider. Let's uh, now see how all of these uh, journeys are articulated. We will provide a short context for each of them, uh, the challenges and risks that those uh, users face uh, in the particular uh, cross-border and cross-sector context, and what Elise suggests to uh, uh, do to address uh, those challenges and risks. Um, so Elizabeth is a data analyst in uh, a public administration. Uh, she has to understand how to transform national SDI's data in data which meet the requirements defined in the inspired technical guidelines. Uh, she is preparing an environmental impact assessment for a cross-border project. Uh, Inspire, as mentioned before, uh, is often considered as a lingua franca uh, especially in the environmental domain, which is its own regional domain, but in cross-border contexts uh, in particular, in general. Um, the challenges and risks uh, that uh, Elizabeth faces uh, can be summarized as uh, displayed here. Uh, one challenge uh, uh, refers to the access to reliable and sustainable data in the right format. Uh, for most uh, uh, private sector actors uh, uh, are trying to work uh, with uh, open and just spatial data. Um, another challenge uh, is related to the integration and uh, the need to link geospatial data with other data types. Um, uh, so what uh, is Elida guidance? Uh, what does Elisa suggest? Uh, well, uh, the first uh, and the foremost input uh, that uh, Elise provides is the use of uh, the Inspire Reference Validator. This is a specific instance of the Reference Validator uh, in uh, relation to the uh, Inspire implementation, as we will see later on. Um, uh, the Inspire Reference Validator uh, allows to pick the resources, uh, being those data services or metadata, uh, select the text to launch and check the results to see how well uh, the data are aligned uh, with the requirements defined in the Inspire technical guidelines or if they should be optimized. Uh, let's now talk about Robert, an ICT manager in a public administration. Uh, he wants to develop a job portal uh, which enables users to view the majority of the maps uh, created by GIS, GIR, 
in, in the form of cross-border layers on an interactive map. We have briefly seen a case, a concrete case of uh, this kind before. Uh, which are the challenges and risks? Uh, well, uh, there can be miswriting and data entering. Mm, this uh, is a typical uh, uh, risk. Uh, there may be limited user experience and understanding uh, in, uh, uh, of cross-border data um, due to linguistic barriers, typically. Um, what can uh, Robert do uh, by exploiting some of Elisa artifacts? Well, uh, what we can suggest, uh, Robert, here is to leverage on uh, the Inspire registry, again, an instance uh, related to the Inspire implementation of the registry, and to avoid common errors, uh, such as entering uh, synonyms, uh, or spelling mistakes when filling in online forms um, to facilitate internationalization of user interfaces by providing multilingual labels and to ensure semantic interoperability when exchanging data between systems and applications. Um, let's now pass to Josh, a representative of a um, private business and he's a digital uh, service public services provider in the transportation domain so he, uh, he provides uh, uh, solutions that are used also in the uh, public services uh, but um, operates uh, in the private sector he wants to provide an online service um, uh, offering a multimodal public transport planner integrating international, national, regional, and urban public transport connections uh, and multimodal because these uh, should include and cover uh, services uh, such as buses, rails, and air transports. Um, what are his uh, uh, challenges and the risks uh, he may face? Um, well, uh, the required data quality uh, may come at a price uh, that is not affordable for him uh, as a um, business owner. Uh, the existing single uh, authentic data source, if it is, exists, may not be fit for purpose in relation to uh, the specific requirements uh, he needs to address. Uh, there may, may be difficulties in, in uh, connecting data uh, between different sources. Um, what uh, does Elise suggest in this case? Well, uh, the possibility to use an online catalog. Uh, there's an example in the uh, join up uh, collaborative platform of the European Commission we were mentioning before of reusable technical solutions. Uh, JoinUp is uh, quite uh, well provided with uh, uh, reusable technical solutions, including uh, those uh, related to uh, the geospatial domain. Uh, the possibility and recommendation actually to use authentic data registers and data services to ensure that location information uh, uh, used in uh, these uh, surveys is trusted and authentic and uh, um, avoid duplication of data and related management processes. And finally, um, uh, a recommendation to use persistent unique identifiers when reusing location data solutions. Finally, uh, a citizen, uh, Anne, um, Anne uh, has to obtain a unique identifier, uh, a, a case uh, maybe the use of a tax identification code, which serves as an identification in many life events uh, when communicating with public authorities. Uh, this unique identifier is calculated based on an algorithm, and part of this algorithm is based on uh, location uh, information, for example, the uh, country and city uh, of birth of the applicant. Um, well, uh, concretely, um, some uh, uh, geospatial data, uh, in this case, uh, present uh, specific challenges uh, for Anne. Um, related to data integration, fading and changes in the name of countries over the years, uh, some um, uh, people may have born in regions that have passed 
uh, from uh, a country to the other or were included in a country that does not exist anymore, as you know, uh, authorities uh, um, uh, may not have uh, the full historical lineage of the data sets available. Uh, and uh, different authorities may uh, have provided different unique identifiers from for the same person uh, uh, throughout his uh, life cycle uh, or her life cycle. Um, so uh, Elise has thought, has thought about that uh, by studying the opportunity of uh, developing a new gazetteer um, uh, data services uh, that uh, could be useful in relation to uh, uh, detailed and accurate information on addresses, historical information on administrative units and uh, uh, information on buildings and their function of use, for example. And typically uh, that could be of use uh, for an uh, indirectly, again, as a, uh, someone who can benefit from uh, this um, approach to uh, face the challenges in uh, asking uh, uh, information such as uh, the tax identification code. Um, then uh, let's uh, now go uh, to uh, the following section of uh, today's webinar. Uh, related uh, specifically and presenting uh, um, ELISE outcomes uh, on uh, the domain of location-based uh, uh, cross-border services. Simon? Yes, indeed. So let's have a look a bit about the solutions that ELISE has uh, supported to develop. So what do you think? Which of those solutions, Inspire Registry, Inspire Reference Validator, Location Interoperability Framework Observatory LIFO and ULF Blueprint, ELISA has supported uh, to develop. Uh, just a hint, there are also multiple choices here, so not only necessary one, only one question is right here, uh, one answer is right here. So let's have another five seconds for your answers. Okay, let's finish and share the results. So very close, very close. As you can see on the next slides when Massimo will reveal the secret, all, all of them are the solutions of. Yes, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed, Simon. I thought that this was an easy one uh, because we had talked uh, about uh, those solutions before. But let's now have an overview of um, uh, the solutions, the main interoperable solutions having relevance for uh, from a cross-border and cross-sector perspective. Um, so um, we were talking about uh, the registry, first of all, first of all. Uh, the the um, registry uh, software has been developed under the ARENA project, which was a predecessor action to ELISA under the ISA, Square Pro ISA program. Um, there's a specific instance uh, uh, deployed uh, uh, in the domain of uh, Inspire implementation. Uh, the Inspire registry, which provides a central access point to a number of centrally managed Inspire registers. The content of these registers are based on the Inspire directive, implementing rules and technical guidelines. Uh, the reference validator, uh, um, the reference uh, um, uh, validator is another um, uh, Cross sector and cross border solution that finds uh, an instance also related to Inspire. Uh, the ULF uh, the blueprint, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, is uh, also one of the main solutions we have mentioned before. Uh, and uh, the uh, connected uh, uh, LIFO observatory, location and uh, interoperability framework observatory is another solution and the Register Federation is another solution as well. Let's delve in uh, each of them specifically. So uh, the Registry and the Register Federation. Uh, the Registry software is a reusable 
open source solution uh, for managing and sharing reference codes uh, uh, through the use of persistent uh, URIs. Um, the register federation in its turn is a distributed federation of registers. Uh, the registry provides a central access point uh, that allows labels and descriptions for reference codes uh, to be easily looked up by humans and or retrieved by machines. Uh, as we said before, uh, the registry and the re um, is a non-domain specific solution which can be used in uh, different uh, uh, sectors and domains uh, not necessarily related to the uh, geospatial domain. Uh, the Inspire um, uh, domain uh, is covered by the Inspire registry instance uh, in particular, um, developed under Elise as well. Um, what you can see here on the right uh, um, summarizes some of the features uh, um, of uh, the registry uh, that uh, also are shared with another solution that we will see later on. Uh, so uh, not only it is developed in a context neutral way, uh, but it is also licensed under an open license such as the UPL uh, 1.2. Uh, an open source license developed by the um, uh, under the uh, support of the European Union. Uh, it is part uh, um, of uh, GitHub now, uh, so to improve uh, collaboration. Uh, it is part, as we said, of the EIF toolbox, um, and thus being recognized uh, as a part of a framework of interoperable um, uh, solutions, and so on and so forth. It is published on JoinUp. Uh, um, it has built-in uh, APIs compliant to do the open API initiative, and so on. And these features are shared, as I said, uh, with another key uh, flagship solution, which is the reference validator. It is a reusable open source uh, tool, tool based on the ETF uh, open source testing framework, which allows data providers, uh, solution providers, and national coordinators to check whether metadata, data sets, and metro services meet the requirements defined in the Inspire implementing rules and the related technical guidelines. Um, it allows, uh, therefore, checking uh, automatically the correctness of data based on predefined rules. Again, it's a non-domain specific uh, solution uh, that has uh, a specific Inspire instance, uh, the Inspire reference validator as well. Some of you may have already used uh, either the uh, generic and the uh, domain specific um, solution. Um, the ULF blueprint is a different kind of solution. It is a framework. So. Um, it's a guidance framework for using location information in policy and digital public services. Uh, it is fully aligned to the European Interoperability Framework, or EIF, as we mentioned before, uh, through its attention of all to all aspects of location interoperability under the different uh, interoperability levels. The blueprint contains recommendations and uh, um, guidance on imp implementation on how to use location effect information effectively and innovatively in policy and digital public services, and how to create a user-driven SDI that will support the needs of those uh, who develop those policies and services. Um, uh, regarding cross-border services, as we see, uh, as we have seen before, uh, the ULF blueprint uh, uh, provides uh, uh, specific recommendations. One example, as we said before, is recommendation seven um, of the blueprint, uh, which reads, uh, use uh, spatial data infrastructure uh, in digital public services and data ecosystems across sectors, level of governments and borders, as we said before, integrated with broader public data infrastructure and external data sources. The uh, ULF blueprint also includes a number of concrete use cases and good practices that uh, you may refer to. Uh, the Location Interoperability Framework Observatory it translates uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, ULF blueprint in an observation tool. 
uh, it is a domain specific observatory related to location interoperability um, uh, that provides uh, a tool to monitor, assess, and report on the state of play of location data member states uh, uh, digital governance programs. In particular, um, uh, LIFO is built on uh, the ULF blueprint as it monitors the alignment of countries participating to the uh, ISA Square program with the ULF blueprint uh, recommendations uh, through a series of questions and related indicators as those that you've seen before. Um, some examples uh, related to uh, the cross-border domain uh, are uh, shown in the picture on the right. So there are indicators uh, related to the cross-border domain under the digital government integration focus area and to the, uh, under the standardization and reuse focus areas. Um, Elise has also uh, dealt with concrete uh, use cases uh, of uh, um, geospatial location information in our cross-border and transnational uh, perspective. We are talking here both of cross-border and transnational perspective as uh, in some cases, as you have seen before, uh, cross-border is strictly uh, considered related to uh, activities uh, per being performed uh, in neighboring countries. But actually, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the uh, location interoperability does not only cover uh, those specific cases, but uh, rather transnational, so wider context in which uh, uh, location data are exchanged uh, uh, between uh, countries which are not necessarily uh, bordering to each other. Um, for, uh, several cross-border pilots have been designed uh, by and developed under ELISE uh, related to the energy efficiency domain, the transport domain, the marine domain, and the cultural heritage domain as well. Uh, under the energy uh, efficiency domain, for example, the pilot has enabled uh, uh, um, and tested uh, the use of geospatial uh, technologies in digital uh, government uh, um, uh, processes, uh, also with uh, a cross-border um, uh, perspective, uh, for example, related to the uh, use and development of uh, energy certificates uh, of buildings uh, uh, that can be uh, reused and interpreted in different uh, member states alike. Uh, transport is uh, also the domain where the pilot uh, developed under ELISE has engaged uh, under uh, an uh, interoperable cross-border and transnational perspective, uh, um, implementing uh, uh, interoperability in that specific uh, domain as well as in the marine domain and other pilot uh, where uh, Elise has considered the use of uh, uh, inspire um, uh, data sets uh, and uh, uh, requ requirements uh, to implement other domain specific uh, um, uh, legislations uh, such as uh, the MSPFD. Uh, the Gazetteer study has been a concrete case of uh, uh, the deployment of um, um, location information in a cross-border uh, perspective has been uh, uh, considered, uh, particularly con to evaluate the visibility of using existing pan-European Gazetteer solutions to satisfy user requirements in terms of lining location with place names and vice versa, as we said before. Uh, there are two upcoming studies. One of those uh, uh, has been mentioned before. Uh, you will find them soon published uh, on the web, uh, in JoinUp in particular, um, on location data uh, used in cross-border contexts. Uh, uh, one uh, that we mentioned specifically before is about sharing and using uh, geospatial data cross borders, and another one is on the evolution of, of the access 
to spatial data uh, for environmental purposes. Um, here, uh, we just list uh, briefly the subjects that will be treated uh, and those two studies that we will see published soon, as we mentioned before. Now, uh, a few key messages to conclude. Simon, maybe, again. Yes, before we switch to the key messages, maybe just a question for you. So far, you have uh, more insight on the interoperable cross-border and cross-sector uh, frameworks and solutions. So what's your opinion uh, according after that, what you've heard so far? So do you think Elisa can bring this experience further to the upcoming Digital Europe program? So what's your, what's your opinion? What's your feeling? Okay, maybe let's close the polling here. I think it's uh, quite positive, uh, quite positive attitudes towards that what's been heard so far. So please, uh, Massimo, continue with the messages. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, actually, um, Elise uh, aims at uh, um, continuing, uh, fostering, uh, making sure that uh, the key messages that uh, it has uh, uh, dealt with uh, will be uh, treated and addressed by future initiatives, as we can see, we will see here. The key messages uh, um, that uh, we wanted to convey here uh, with specific reference to the cross-border domain are uh, first, location interoperability is a key enabler, as we said at the beginning, to cross-border sharing of data. Uh, second, uh, adopting a common interoperability framework and reference architecture ensures that interoperability is addressed, especially when there is the intention to reuse existing solutions as those that we've seen before, both developed by ELISA and also studied by ELISA and developed under other initiatives. Uh, third, spatial data infrastructures and their evolutions uh, into data spaces can foster the cross-border exchange and use of location data. And fifth, um, uh, location assets being procured uh, uh, should be uh, as interoperable and reusable as possible, as we have considered uh, in our early um, stages of this uh, uh, journey with you today. Uh, particularly with the, in reference to the Digital Europe program, uh, uh, which is uh, taking the relay from uh, uh, ISA Square, which is the program uh, under which Elisa has operated, uh, uh, and of uh, CEF uh, Digital as well. Um, we have identified some um, key topics uh, to uh, reinforce. Uh, particularly in relation with uh, objective uh, five of the digital euro program uh, that is the deployment and best use of digital capacities and interoperability um, uh, implementing uh, uh, harmonized cross-border digital services infrastructure and promote uh, interoperable multilingual cross-border or cross-sector solutions and common frameworks within public administration is key for uh, the Digital Europe program and the achievement of that objective. Um, second, uh, supporting interoperability and standardization, as well as fostering the de deployment of EU cross-border application is a, a key enabler to reach that objective. And uh, third, deploying decentralized solutions and infrastructures required for large scale digital applications uh, such as smart uh, rural areas, uh, just to name an example, in support of transport, energy, agricultural and environmental policies is another key factor to consider uh, under this objective. Um, going further uh, on, uh, uh, the Digital Europe program, uh, there are, as some of you may know, um, five uh, uh, pillars uh, on which uh, the Digital Europe program is built. Uh, on several of them, uh, Elise has uh, its say in uh, uh, providing uh, inputs and uh, 
topics that can be taken over by the digital euro program there will be actually a, a specific uh, um, location dimension in the digital euro program um, specifically uh, under the artificial intelligence uh, um, there's a reference to the need to set up a, a true european data space and this is something that we've mentioned clearly before under the area of uh, advanced uh, digital skills Elise uh, has uh, its say as, uh, in uh, supporting the design and delivery of uh, specialized uh, programs and the upskilling of the existing workforce uh, in the uh, uh, key capacity area of geospatial uh, knowledge and skills. Uh, thirdly, under the pillar of ensuring the wide use of digital technologies across the economy and society, uh, this is something that specifically uh, refers to reuse of uh, uh, solutions. Um, Elise has uh, its uh, say in uh, relation to the uh, dimensions of supporting European public administrations and industry to deploy and access state-of-the-art digital technologies and build trust in the digital transformation and uh, in uh, so far it's uh, the uh, so far the support of high impact deployments in areas of public interest uh, such as smart communities are uh, is concerned uh, the uh, solutions such as the validate reference validator and the registry uh, will be con continued, uh, will continue to be maintained under uh, the Digital Euro program as well. So uh, this ends uh, uh, our presentation today. Um, we are happy to uh, uh, therefore conclude this uh, presentation uh, with some space for you, maybe, uh, Simon? Yes, thank you very much, Massimo, for uh... Uh, walking us through this uh, quite uh, uh, wide field uh, or objective that uh, Elisa has uh, dealt with in the past years. Uh, I've uh, checked uh, the chat box uh, about uh, comments or questions that were now, so maybe somebody would like to, to ask live, maybe. Is there any intention, any wish, someone to co comment, to ask, to add something? It's clear that it was, this was an overview of an uh, Elise objective area, as mentioned at the beginning, uh, interoperable frameworks uh, uh, solutions uh, that uh, was uh, on one hand already presented two weeks ago at the digital public uh, event. And the webinars, uh, these three webinars this week are somehow complementing uh, this event with a, a bit more in-depth uh, overview of the achievements, outputs, and deliverables of uh, ELISA on um, each of the fields. Uh, so if there are no questions, uh, uh, so I would uh, invite you then um, and uh, for another webinar tomorrow, so the third one in the row this week, uh, which will be about emerging trends and technologies. So at the same time at two o'clock, you are kindly welcome. And with this, I would uh, like to thank you all for your uh, uh, attention today. And of, of course, invite you to, as mentioned already in the chat box, to join us uh, at the uh, Elisa community. So as a connection, a collection. So uh, Elisa collection on the join up. You can follow us on Twitter or subscribe to Elise's uh, video channel, where all these uh, videos and the variety of webinars that Elise has already performed uh, during past years are already there to, uh, uh, to follow. So thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>